Well, I'd like to ask you, what is something really gutsy, bold, that a bold request that you've made? I, I'm not talking low-level boldness, like Discount Dave, going to a pizza shop and asking if they'll accept a coupon, a coupon that's expired, an expired coupon from a competitor's pizza shop, okay? Uh, now, as traumatic as that was to my friends next to me that pizza night, uh, I'm talking bold request. Have you ever gone up to your boss and said, I need a big promotion. In fact, what's the boldest request you've ever made? Maybe that gut-wrenching, risky request, will you marry me? Or maybe after you're married, it's a wife saying to a husband, will you completely renovate the house? Or if that's too much work, just buy me a new one. Okay, that's pretty big. But what if instead of a request to spend lots of money, it was a bold request to cut up an invoice, a whopper of a debt? Uh, hello, bank, my mortgage lender. I'd like you to erase my home loan, please. Wipe it clean. Now that is gutsy. Unfortunately, I know what the bank would say. <laughs> Fortunately, I also know what God would say to us differently, positively, if we sincerely come to him asking him to cut up our debt, our moral debt called sin. In fact, a whole lifetime of sin, my biggest, most costly debt. On Good Friday, we considered that very gutsy request made from uh, a societal scum bucket, a guilty traitor crucified next to Jesus who had nothing to boast and nothing to say to Jesus, look at all my good deeds, I am such a good guy. No, nothing. And this criminal audaciously said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Maybe the only thing more shocking than that request is Jesus' answer, which we will consider. This morning's big question that we face is, how can we escape the deadly consequence of sin? And the answer to that is our main idea, that only Jesus can pay our sins for us. And we're going to look at our Bible passage outlined, unpacked in five bold, audacious statements. And that is these, that it's a bold prayer. We're going to see a bold temptation, a bold rebuke, a bold request, and then a bold promise. Now, now on Good Friday, we meditate on the death of Jesus and why he gave his life. And on Resurrection Sunday, we're going to think about the resurrection and what hope that means. But Jesus dying in our place and rising from the dead, well, that is how Easter puts death back in its box. So our theme for the, the weekend, is culturally, we might express this theme that Jesus robs the reaper of the spoils of death. Uh, the reaper being that mythical character who shows up at death's door uh, to reap his harvest. Now, the reaper isn't real, but death is, and Jesus is real, and Jesus brings life eternal, robbing death of its sting, pain, sin's condemnation. That's what Easter's about. So let's first consider this bold prayer. Uh, we're going to spend extra time here to set the context, and then every point will get shorter as we go. Not many people wake up knowing that this is their last day on earth, that this is it. But on this day, 2,000 years ago, two criminals knew this was their last day of drawing breath on earth. Verses 22 and 32 and 33 say, Two others, criminals who were led away to be executed with Jesus, uh, when they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him, Jesus, there along with the criminals, one on the right, one on the left. 
Death saturates this scene. As Josh said, it is a, it's a morbid topic, but one that must be addressed. The place is called the skull. Now, in Greek, we know that cranium. In Latin, it's Calvary, if you've heard that word. In Aramaic, it's Golgotha, and we hear all of those around this time of year. Skull. It's the place of death. It's the place where execution happened. Romans executed people right outside the city gate of Jerusalem. Now, the bold criminal that we talked about earlier, who eventually trusts in Jesus, sometimes he's called the thief on the cross. But mere theft did not get you crucified. Roman crucifixion was reserved for the highest crimes and offenses. So picketing protesters or um, vegan storming animal farms to rescue piglets, that would not get you crucified. See, these two guys, they were either murderers or they were traitors who led revolts against the government, or maybe both. And some think Barabbas was their leader, uh, the Barabbas who was freed. But they were political revolutionaries. And, and this is how Christ, the Christ-rejecting Jews portrayed Jesus to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. He is a political revolutionary. He's dangerous. Execute him. That's how Jesus was portrayed falsely, but that's what these two guys actually were. So he's no upstanding citizen. He is no kind neighbor. He's a hardened criminal, angry at the world, angry at his circumstances, and likely angry at God. In fact, if he knew about Jesus before this day at all, he would probably thought of him like this. Oh, you're, you're that, that guy I've heard about. That gutless wimp, Jesus. He tells his disciples to pay taxes and to turn the other cheek, to bless those who curse you and pray for those who persecute you. They call him the Prince of Peace. We don't need peace. We need to overthrow the shackles of Rome. These religious guys with all their talk... All they ever do is talk. We need action, revolution. Our God has allowed us Jews to become slaves to Rome. If God exists at all, he must be weak or he doesn't care about us. You see, if we summed up the state of this man in a sentence, he was far from God and far from good. You know, we know this to be true because... Uh, the other gospel accounts portray this. Just as today when you read biographies about famous people, Lady Di or Nelson Mandela, written by different authors, those authors highlight different details. And Matthew and Mark point out that the criminals, plural, these two guys, both mocked Jesus early in the day as they hung there. Far from good and far from God, this criminal on the cross next to Jesus, is inching toward death on a one-way street. Crucifixion was so horrific, it led to a new word to describe the pain of the cross. Excruciating, out of the cross. Particularly painful were the nails in the feet where you have so many nerves as all of your body weight was supported. Whether the location of the giant nail was through the heel, as in this excavated example, or the ankle, or the toes, nerves are everywhere. Those nerves that make a foot massage all feel so good make these nails feel excruciating. Death was agonizingly slow as you suffocated to death. You you had to push up to expand your rib cage and breathe until the point where they cracked your legs and you suffocated. But even worse than the pain was the shame. Crucifixion wasn't done in private in in a, a dark prison cell. It was a deterrent against riots and rebellion. Crucifixion was public, very deliberately public and very public, along the street, the marketplace, for all to see, children included as a warning. 
It also served as an opportunity for everyone from the self-righteous to the riffraff to come and gather and mock and spit at you and curse you. Probably so they felt better about themselves. And verse 34 tells us they wagered bets. Sometimes the soldiers gambled if you had expensive clothes because they strip you naked, and the movies don't show that, but um, they gamble for your clothes. And uh, others, common people, would often gamble to see who would die first. The whole scene's a bit like folk at the local TAB who are watching a race, putting money on betting that you are going to kick the bucket first. And they insult and spit, and you hang there agonizing and naked and ashamed. There was nothing you could do except curse them back. Crucifixion was not just death by torture. It was the stripping of all dignity. As we think about, we did this to Jesus, the Son of God become flesh. How did Jesus respond? Did he curse back? The sinless son of God, the righteous one, had every right to. But verse 34 finally now records his bold prayer. Father, forgive them. Forgive them? These mockers, these moral monsters? Into this hellhole of hate and self-interest, Jesus brought love and forgiveness. See, this did not go unnoticed by our criminal, who at this point starts questioning his previous thinking that if God, whoops, if, uh, if God existed, he'd be weak or uncaring. And now instead he's thinking, I've heard, I've heard the charges the Jews made against Jesus of blasphemy that he claimed to be God. And he is seeking our forgiveness. This God clearly cares. And and I know I have no desire at all for the forgiveness of those mocking me. That takes moral courage and strength that I don't have. I am weak. Jesus is strong. I've gotten things wrong about God, but, but what hope is there Now, you see, I've lived far from God, and now I'm dying far from Him. Maybe that describes you this morning, living distant from God, and also dying distant from God, because every day, all of us are inching closer to death on a one-way street. What hope did He have Well, the same hope that we do. So let's move on to the next point because in Jesus we see perfect resolve against bold temptation. See, it's it's now that Jesus' love and power is put to the utmost test because three times from three groups, Jesus is tempted to save himself. We see this clearly in verses 35 to 39. Uh, I'm not going to read it all, but you can see three groups, Jewish leaders, Roman soldiers, and now one criminal, sneer. Even passers-by, it says, are saying the same thing. There's more than these. If you are really the Messiah, prove it. Prove it, Savior. Save yourself. This is so tempting because all of us naturally want to defend our reputation. He is the Messiah, All of us naturally want to save ourselves. What makes it harder still is that Jesus is suffering unjustly. He doesn't deserve to be punished at all, never mind crucifixion. And then what made it harder, harder still, is that he had divine power to end the suffering. See, that same power that Jesus used when They tried to make him king before he fulfilled all the required prophecies. And you read the Gospels, and they tried to force him into, and he just slipped through the crowds, it said. The same power that he had when he was resurrected, and the disciples were locked up away, hiding in fear, and the door was locked, and he slipped through the door. 
You see, right now, he could just slip out of those nails, but he chose not to for us. You see, he was born to die, born to die for us. See, fully aware of the agony awaiting that night he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before handing him over himself over to arrest, Jesus prayed, What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But I have come for the purpose of this hour. And this hour is dying on a cross in our place for our sins. The Bible makes this so clear. He forgave all our sins, erasing the certificate of that moral debt that's against us, taking it away, how? By nailing it to the cross, cutting up that whopper of an invoice that we talked about at the start. That's what Jesus came to do. This is why he must stay on the cross. So that, that third insult from the remaining criminal mocking had to be the hardest. See, that's the one that said, save yourself and us. He is literally asking for the impossible. God, make a circular square. You see, Jesus could save himself or he could save us, not both, because Jesus saves us by not saving himself. See, only Jesus lived the life we should have lived so that only Jesus can die the death that we deserve as our perfect sinless substitute to erase our debt and take it on himself. Few people have phrased this better than Pastor John Stott, who said, the concept of substitution lies at the heart of both sin and salvation. For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. <laughs> Worship me. While the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. See, the good news of Jesus is summed up so clearly in it. It's in a, a little song we sing that children know too. Holy God in love became perfect man to bear my blame. On the cross, he took my sin, and by his death, I live again. See, man-made hero stories, they actually have it all backwards, like the Avengers, you know, a massive team of good guys, you know, work together to slay the epic singular foe. No, there's only one good guy. And on his own, he takes on every foe. You see, he takes on the sins of a whole world of us bad guys. See, the hero, our hero, dies for the villain. Us. While we were his enemies, Christ died for us to reconcile us with God, with the Father. And our criminal, our villain, next to Jesus on the cross, finally gets this, and he, he serves up a bold rebuke. Instead of joining the insulting and the mocking as he did earlier, now he actually challenges this other criminal opposite Jesus. He says, rebuking him, don't you even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are being punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. He, he's openly confessing to his co-criminal, I'm a dirty, rotten, rotten scoundrel, and you too, mate. But Jesus has no sin. Literally, he has not done one thing wrong. You see, with conviction comes clarity. Humbled eyes to see clearly that he really sees his sin and really needs a Savior. 
Have you really seen your sin? Even, even the venomous thoughts and motives behind what is said and done. Have you realized what you deserve like he did in your need for a savior? See, with conviction comes clarity. With convictions we speak truly. And it's not easy to rebuke anyone. Confrontation isn't fun, but this criminal is more than rebuking. He's exalting. You see, he is, he's praising and defending Jesus while everyone around is mocking. And that too is hard to go against the tide of common sentiment. But the criminal finally sees the value of Jesus, and we praise what we prize. So he realizes Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and he realizes that death is not the end of Jesus. So finally, he makes his bold request. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, the The other criminal likely at this stage threw it back at him. (laughs) Yeah, with all those sinful, scandalous years, you prodigal. Jesus, tell him he's dreaming. The request was gutsy. It was a pledge of complete trust in Jesus and zero trust in himself. A pledge to honor Christ as king if the king would receive him into his kingdom. Now, you might think Jesus would have responded with caution, with skepticism. (laughs) Don't you think it's a little late for you to be thinking about my kingdom? But Jesus didn't reply. He did not reply. The kingdom of God is not for such as you. He didn't put him on probation and say, well, show me what you got. See, salvation is not granted by how much we've done. It's granted because of everything that Jesus has done. And so Jesus can give him an ironclad promise. Today, I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. You with me. After the criminal probably double-checked his hearing that he heard Jesus right, what have you been feeling? To think the likes of him would receive this gracious promise of forgiveness and fellowship with God forever. This God who would be crucified for the likes of him. I reckon he would have been thinking something like, you know, when I reached out to Jesus and I thought his kingdom would be a distant future and that's why I asked him to remember me. But Jesus made it clear uh, he didn't need to wor- I didn't need to worry about his memory because I would be in paradise with him before this day was over. These are the greatest words Jesus could ever say to me or to anyone. Jesus could make his bold promise because he did not give in to the temptation. See, he stayed on the cross. The passage shows Jesus was victorious See, the curtain of the temple was split down the middle. The the torn temple curtain shows that Jesus' death tore through that symbolic barrier between holy God and sinful man. The payment was made. Jesus has opened the door to heaven for us. The reaper's been robbed. Cut up my bill, it's been nailed to the cross. See, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. That doesn't sound victorious, does it? But it was. See, he breathed his last until Resurrection Sunday when he breathed and lived again. Come back Sunday to hear the second half of the Easter message. But notice verse 46. With a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I've been a pastor for more than 20 years, and I've done a lot of hospital visitations, and I've been around a fair few dying people. Some at the very, very end of their life, their last breaths, including my father. I can assure you that as people get weaker, they speak more softly. Not Jesus. 
See, he shouted because he entered death not in defeat, but in triumph. John writes his gospel knowing that now everything was accomplished. Jesus said, it is finished. Jesus was in complete control, and he gave himself over to death. See, even the centurion standing there recognized this. And in verse 47, he glorified God, saying this man really was righteous. The other gospel writers say this man truly was the Son of God. That extra detail the centurion says. What about you? Do you recognize who Jesus is and what he accomplished? See, our passage ends with verse 48. All the crowds who gathered for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, went home striking their chest. They were in shock, in deep reflection about Jesus. As you go home today, what will you be thinking about Jesus? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, God's standard, God's pass mark to heaven. So we all have a choice to make, and it is two opposite choices that we see in these two criminals. This criminal, Jesus pays our penalty as our substitute, and this criminal, we pay our penalty. Jesus offers life, and the wages of sin is death. What we deserve is a wage, not just physical death, eternal death. See, because without Jesus, we will continue sinning and we will keep extending our prison sentence. How you respond to Christ crucified will determine how God responds to you eternally. We began this passage by making a bold, talking about bold, gutsy requests. And I reckon one of the boldest, gutsiest requests anyone can make is to ask someone, anyone, for forgiveness. It's gutsy because when you do that, what are you admitting? You're admitting, I'm, I'm wrong. I've wronged you. And therefore, that person can reject your request because you're in the wrong. How gutsy then to ask God to forgive you. And this is why Martin Luther said, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. A pledge of complete trust in Jesus and zero trust in self. But see, there's no rejection because of Jesus if we're trusting in him. He's paid the penalty. He is the key. And the criminal on the cross teaches us that Jesus is gracious and forgiving and he will turn no one away. He will reject no one who humbly comes to him, who sincerely makes that bold request. It's a request you must personally make. Your parents' requests won't do. Your friends, your family heritage, you must make it. The request involves confessing your heartfelt grief over offending and pretending. Offending God that you've offended his character, his priorities, his laws, and pretending that you're him, that you're the center of the universe, and that you're righteous. And then gladly clinging to Christ alone as your righteousness. Recognizing he's the king of kings and honoring him. I plead that you do so this day. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for sending Jesus, your precious son. Thank you for delivering us from eternal anguish we deserve by taking upon yourself, Jesus, Son of God. You know, trusting in you is not a passport to a pain-free life. That criminal on the cross still had hours of anguish after he trusted in you. But he had a, a sympathetic Savior who knows suffering alongside, not just to encourage or show us the way, but to bring us home to God. And Lord, I pray that some this moment would sincerely, repentantly make that bold request of asking you to pay for their sin, 
trusting in your bold promise of forgiveness and eternal life, pledging to honor and follow you. Lord, this criminal had only minutes to honor you in the world. I pray that we will have years because you are glorious. Thank you for the victory of your cross. In Christ's name, amen.